we're going to, to talk tonight about memory and we're going to talk a bit about the brain. This is the only neurological lecture you're going to get. So I'm going to, to go into a little bit about how the brain works, specifically with regard to memory. And we're going to focus a lot on, on memory and aging. Um, I know there, I don't see anyone here who's a, over age 60 as far as I can see in the audience. <laughs> but if there were people over age 60, they start to get concerned about their memory and, and this is something we're going to talk about. What is normal memory? What is abnormal memory? What you can do to help your memory? And, and you'll find out, it's always good to say what the message is going to be. One of the most important things to do is to remain intellectually active, such as coming out to mini med school. So by virtue of being here tonight, you're taking a very big step to preserving your memory. So, so let's start. We like to focus on patients. So let, let's talk about a day in the, the memory clinic uh, a few years ago. So two patients come into the memory clinic. Um, Mrs. Green, not her real name, and Mr. Brown. They're both 70 years old, both complaining of memory loss. So Mrs. Green had noticed that she was unable to concentrate when the TV was on. She had lost her car in the parking lot. She came out of the, the hospital the other day. She couldn't find her car in the parking lot. And she ran into, uh, she went to the, the synagogue for the first time in a year. I'm sure none of you do that. But for those who just go to the synagogue once a year, she ran into an old acquaintance and she couldn't remember his name. So she was very concerned. She came to the memory clinic and we carried out formal testing uh, of her memory, similar to tests that, that Victor might have given to you before the, the show tonight results were normal, so, so she was a little reassured. Mr. Brown also had complaints. He had noticed that, that he was forgetting conversations he'd had that day uh, about what he was going to do in the evening. He, he just wouldn't remember by the end of the day. He was forgetting appointments, for example, forgetting when he had to come to mini med school. He was mixing up the date. So he carried out formal testing of his memory with a psychologist and in the clinic, and his results were abnormal. So what happened over the next eight years since they showed up that day? Well, Mrs. Green has done well. She has no change in her memory. Uh, she's still well. She's still doing what she was before. And our conclusion was that she was showing normal changes of cognitive aging, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Mr. Brown, on the other hand, the story isn't so good. He had gradual worsening of his memory over the subsequent years. He began to forget words. Uh, he began to forget uh, uh, that what day it was, what month it was, and eventually he was diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease, and now he is, has a moderate dementia. So that's a, a, a sad story. So what we're going to be talking about today is that, that there is memory changes which we consider normal, and there are memory changes with aging which are abnormal. And uh, uh, this forms a spectrum, a spectrum of cognition. Cognition is the breadth of thinking, so thinking in the elderly. We're going to talk about normal aging, and we're going to talk about abnormal aging. And this is a good way to think about it, that we all run into some older people who we call the super normals. Those are people who, whose memory doesn't show any decline from when they were young. For instance, uh, I had a, a, an aunt in Israel who, who would phone if uh, she'd phone and say, I'm very worried about, about you, and you'd say, why are you worried? Because 37 relatives sent me birthday cards and you didn't. I'm worried that you're sick. <laughs> so this woman had had no change in her memory from the time she was young. She was in the super normal group. Most people, however, um, most people show some change in their memory from the time they're young. But it's consistent with other people their own age. We call this age consistent loss. They're average for their age. And this is about, we call these normal elderly people. About 75% of the elderly fall into this group. So these are all normal elderly. We're also going to talk about something called mild cognitive impairment. What we would have termed Mr. Brown as having when he showed up in memory clinic eight years ago. Mild changes in memory. We've seen about 8 to 16 percent of the elderly population. Some people in that category stay stable and don't get worse. Others progress over time and end up with dementia. And dementia, which is significant loss of memory and thinking due to brain disease, affects about 8 percent of the elderly population. And we're going to talk about that as well. So we're going to talk about three 
categories within the elderly. We're going to talk about those who are normal. We consider to show normal cognitive aging. We're going to talk about uh, a group that have dementia that form about 8% of the elderly. And we're going to talk about this in-between group that we're calling mild cognitive impairment. So first let's start with, with what is normal. So normal cognitive aging, what is it? Well, you may have noticed, those of you who are, are over age 40, that you begin to show changes of aging. It's not a surprise. You don't run as fast as you did when you were 18. Uh, is anyone here uh, tried to play a video game with their grandchildren? You're going to lose. You're not a, your responses aren't as fast. You can't manipulate the buttons as, as quickly. But this is normal. You're going to slow down a bit as you get older. The brain changes as well with age. It's not just the bones. It's not just your speed. It's not just your muscles. The brain ages. And we call this cognitive aging. And it can be normal. Uh, what are the problems that people complain of with normal cognitive aging? Well, the first and most common is a problem concentrating with distraction. Now, I have some, some teenagers here. You can go into their room and the, the CD is playing. They're talking on the phone. It's noisy. And they're doing their homework at the same time. You say, how can you possibly be doing your homework with all that distraction? And yet they're able to do that. But when you get to be over age 40, you just can't focus with distraction. You can't attend to all of these things at once. And this problem concentrating with distraction is part of cognitive aging. So that's the first item on the, the normal aging list. The second is difficulty recalling names. Now, I don't mean names of, of your children or your grandchildren, but, but that example of going in someplace you haven't been for a year, the synagogue is a good example. Um, well, all right. Many, I'm sure everyone, maybe that works for me. I'm sure everyone here has been there every week. But you go someplace you haven't been in six months or ten months. You see someone, an acquaintance, you haven't seen them in months. You can't find their name. And you go home and think, what was that fellow's name? And it drives you nuts. You wake up in the middle of the night. Finally, it comes back. That is normal cognitive aging, difficulty recalling names of acquaintances. Spatial memory problems is the, are the third most common complaint of older people. And if you want to have a good test of your spatial memory, park your car in the Jewish General Hospital parking lot, <laughs> come in to have your MRI scan and wait two or three hours, and then go back to the parking lot and try to find your car. And if, it ta if you have trouble remembering where exactly you parked it, that's spatial memory. And problems with spatial memory are very common when you get over age 40. The last is a problem in delayed verbal memory. Now here's a good, a good way to test that. Well, Victor tested that with his three words, but, but have your spouse give you a list of 10 things to get at Metro. Go to Metro, come back with uh, bagels, come back with cream cheese, come back with, and get a list, and then don't write it down. Go to Metro, wait half an hour, stop at second cup on the way, listen to the radio, and then go in and say, now what am I supposed to get? If you're 18, you'll remember that whole list without any difficulty. People who are into their 50s and 60s are going to come home without the bagels, or, or come home with too many bagels, or come home with the wrong kind of bagels. So this is delayed verbal memory word lists that, that uh, give you problems. And this is why at the beginning of the, the, the pregame show, we were showing you tricks to help you uh, trigger your memory, making lists and, and linking them by association. We need these because loss and decline in your verbal memory is part of normal cognitive aging. So, now, if you have normal cognitive aging, what can you do to keep your memory as good as possible as you age? And I made, this is the important list. The first thing is choose your parents very carefully. <laughs> Uh, because genetics plays a role in cognitive aging. Some families, people keep their memory as they get up to their 80s. Some families, they don't. Well, you can't choose your parents. Uh, so there's not much you can do about that. You have your genetic aging mechanism. Some people are going to lose memory more than others. The second item on the list maybe isn't so easy to affect also, but have as much money as possible. This is. <laughs> And this is, this is a good suggestion as you age for, for your physical health as, as well as your brain health. It has been shown that people with, with 
the higher socioeconomic levels had have better health in general and better preservation of their memory. Uh, nothing much you can do about that, perhaps. But you can affect the third item, which is keep intellectually stimulated, such as coming to mini med school tonight. Intellectual stimulation really does help. The use it or lose it approach to your brain is very much true. So keep intellectually stimulated. Play bridge if you like bridge. If you don't like bridge, don't play bridge. <laughs> but if you like card games, do them. Go to lectures, read books, anything you enjoy. These things are going to stimulate your brain and keep your memory active. The fourth item on the list, treat your medical problems. It's been shown that people who don't take care of themselves, don't treat their diabetes, their high blood pressure, and their kidney problems, these things will affect your memory as well. So if you need another reason to look after yourself medically, it's your brain and your memory. Fifth thing on the list, keep physically fit. They've done some tremendous experiments where they went into a nursing home, they got all the people out of their chairs watching TV and sent in physiotherapists and got them to jog around the nursing home and get back into shape. People's mental age came down by eight years. In other words, the cognitive aging of their memory was reversed and, and improved. And it's now very clear and there's good evidence that if you keep physically fit, go over to the coming center or the Y or run around the block. If you keep physically fit, it affects your brain and your memory, and it's a, one of the most important things you can do to keep your memory good. Next on the list, avoiding things that are bad for your brain. Avoid sedatives, sleeping pills, alcohol, fatigue, and I put depression on the, the list because uh, that's not the same as alcohol, but we know that's another thing which has a, an adverse effect on your, your memory. So, uh, avoid alcohol sedatives, avoid over uh, lack of sleep, and we know depression has a negative effect on memory as well. The next item is a little hard to know whether you can actually affect it, but they've done studies looking at personality, and some people are, are rigid in their personalities and don't adapt to, to new changes in their lifestyle, in their environment. Those people who are rigid don't age as well as people who are flexible. Now, I don't know if you can change from a rigid to a flexible person, but, but it's better to be flexible. And then the last thing is stress. Don't worry. <laughs> stress has an effect on the brain. There have been some excellent studies, especially from McGill University, showing people who are under tremendous stress, it affects their brain. You can see shrinkage of parts of your brain, which I'm going to show you involved in memory, the hippocampus and it does affect your memory level. So the, the stress level that people go through, and this is even younger people, it will affect your memory and this is something to watch for. So these are, this is the list of the things that you can do to keep your memory as good as possible as you age. And this is uh, the, the, the most important thing in this lecture is to, to keep this list in front of you. Now, what about other things? There is no really good evidence that all the things that you can get at the health food store are going to make a big impact on your memory. That includes going to take ginkgo, ginseng, estrogen, vitamin E, antioxidants, anything you find in the health magazines. People tell me, people ask me, should I go to the, the health food store and, and get ginseng? And I say, if you go to the health food store to get ginseng, the main thing you're doing for your memory is the walk to the health food store. <laughs> So the exercise of going to the store is probably more important in the long run than, than taking additives. Now, taking additives, some of these are, are stimulants and they, they lift you up and make you feel more alert. Uh, but the question of will they, have they been shown to preserve the memory of normal people as they get older, there really isn't very impressive evidence. Um, th there are others where there have been some studies, I always put phosphatidylserine because there have been some studies, but these were somewhat in the past and we're probably not even suggesting that. So really nothing at the health food store is really worth putting yourself on for your memory. Now, let's jump from normal aging and, and the normal people and I should hasten to add that we've just talked about 80% of the population up till now. 80% of people over age 65 fall in that normal category. So that's four out of five people. So, so the good news is that as you get older, 
for, you've got an 80% chance that you're going to stay in the normal aging category. So that's good news. We're going to jump from talking about the normal elderly to talking about dementia and talking about Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a, a, a slide which, which shows the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in the population. That just means what percentage of the, the population have these diseases. And this is the age of the group. You can see that when you're dealing with a group of people in their mid-70s, we're talking about between 5 and 10 percent of the population have dementia. When we're talking about a group of people in their age 85 to 89, it goes up to about a quarter of the population. And when we get up to a group of 90-year-olds, you get them together in a room, probably about a third of them have dementia. So dementia is very much related to, to age. And the biggest risk for dementia is, is age. And as the population, as our health gets better, and as we live longer, there are going to be more and more people in society who have dementia. And that, that's a very worrisome thing. What it amounts to is we can project year by year the number of people in Canada who are going to be suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Now, let me jump in here just to, to tell you this slide shows Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease makes up uh, about two-thirds of the, the group of dementia, as I'll show you in a minute. So right now, there are about 300,000 people in Canada who have Alzheimer's disease. By 2031, that will rise to 750,000, more than doubling. And this is going to be a tremendous strain on the healthcare system. And, and it's really something that, that people are starting to get quite concerned about. And it's a race between the researchers looking for cures and the aging of the Canadian population to see uh, if we're going to have that many people with dementia or are we going to be able to prevent dementia. Something you should know about dementia, that a lot of dementia is out there and we don't even know. There are studies that, that show that, that right now there are probably about 25,000 people with Alzheimer's disease who are diagnosed and treated. There are another 15,000 who are diagnosed but not getting any treatment. But there are probably close to 100,000 people who are undiagnosed. And this is partly a, a feature of lack of education. Many families around Canada think that if the, the father or the grandfather gets older and loses memory and becomes unable to function and go out, that this is normal aging. And one message I'm trying to get across is that dementia is not normal. We don't consider that to be part of normal aging. What used to, people would refer to as senility and think senility is part of aging. We don't believe that to be the case anymore. 80% of the population ages normally, 20% have significant memory loss, and senility is another word for dementia, which is due to brain disease. So we view this as a disease, and it's a disease, a set of diseases that we hope to be able to treat and cure in the future. So it's not normal. So if you know a family where someone has significant memory loss, that person should be seen by their doctor, diagnosed, and, and treated because we're beginning to have treatments. I mentioned that dementia is not one disease. It's, in fact, perhaps a family of diseases. Dementia refers to significant loss in several areas of thinking, mainly memory, but it's more than memory. There, there are changes in, in language, in planning ability, emotional changes, changes in personality. So dementia is a whole picture of brain disease. Now, within the, the, uh, the area of dementia, let's see if I can get this to work, Alzheimer disease AD accounts for about 65% of the cases of dementia. About two-thirds of dementia is due to this specific disease. But there are other causes of dementia. About 5% are what we call vascular dementia due to problems with strokes or blood flow in the brain. Another large group, about 10 or maybe more, 10% or more, are mixed. That is, there's an element of vascular dementia and there's Alzheimer's disease present as well. In addition, there's a set of other dementias that account for smaller percentages. I'm not really going to go into them much. There's one called Lewy body dementia. There's something called frontal lobe dementia. There's Jakob Creutzfeldt disease, which is very rare, but is 
related to the mad cow disease everyone's heard about. So these are, are a small part of the, the cake and we're going to focus most of our attention on Alzheimer's disease because it really is the majority of cases. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the brain. It's not normal aging. But it's a disease where we don't really know the cause. And one of the things I'm very proud of at this hospital is we have a very active research unit in the Bloomfield Center where researchers are doing very important basic research into the cause of the disease. Because until we know the cause, we won't really be able to stop it. Now, this slide lists the, the, the four major areas where we think the disease may be caused by reflected in four major changes in the brain. Uh, if you look in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, you see changes which are referred to as senile plaques, which I'll show a picture of in a moment. And these are due to collections of amyloid. Many people believe that amyloid is the culprit and the cause of the disease. We also see changes called neurofibrillary tangles. And these tangles are due to another protein called tau. Some Researchers believe that tau is the main cause. Then we see neuronal death, loss of neurons, the cells of the brain. And we see degeneration of synapses, the connections between those cells. And those might be the, the main cause of the disease also. So we're not sure exactly what is causing the disease. It may be a cascade of interrelated changes. And this is a, a, an area around the world where there's tremendous focus of research right now. This is a, a cartoon showing what the brain looks like. And <coughs> what this is trying to show is that we have neurons, the main cell of the brain here. And you see neurons. Here's a neuron. And there are large connections called axons that connect one neuron to the next. And around the, the end of the axon, we see a collection which is called a plaque, the senile plaque I referred to before. We see these plaques in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, and they're made up of a protein called amyloid, and we think that amyloid, abnormalities in the amyloid, might be the cause of Alzheimer's disease. This shows that blood cells bring blood to the brain, and the amyloid may be coming from the blood cells. There are other cells called microglial cells that may be involved. The brain is a complex place. And uh, there's a lot of work, as I said, going on right now into trying to unravel the connection between these plaques, which we always see in the brain, and the disease, the dementia, the memory loss itself. There are well-defined risk factors and protective factors in developing Alzheimer's disease. And as I mentioned, the main risk factor is age. As people get older, the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease goes up extraordinarily. There is a, a gene called ApoE, which has different types. And it's been found that one of the types, ApoE4, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. If everyone has an ApoE type, which carries lipids in their blood, those of you who have an E4 gene have a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't mean you're going to get it for certain, but the risk is increased. In the same way, a family history is a risk factor. Those of you who have a member of the family who has had Alzheimer's disease have about double the risk of other people of developing the disease. And finally, anyone who develops mild cognitive impairment, this mild memory loss state I'm going to talk about in a minute, that is, can be viewed as a risk factor because you have much higher chance of developing Alzheimer's disease if you already have mild memory loss. There have been uh, uh, recently some other risk factors that have been added to the list. Some people believe that women are at a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Other researchers think it's just because women live longer than men. And, and therefore, they get older and they have a higher risk because they're older. Low education is a factor. Now, now this does not mean education, for example, that you went to Concordia instead of McGill or you. Um, <laughs> No, is if you had less than four years education, which doesn't happen very commonly in our society, but happens very commonly in China and India, if you have very low education, you're at much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. It's as if you're, you're developing a store of neuronal connections. Education is strengthening the brain connections, and that's going to help you 50, 60 years later in preventing Alzheimer's disease. Now, 
another risk which I'm going to come back to is vascular factors. What I mean there is all of the, the, the bad health factors that put you at higher risk of heart disease, and you heard about those a few weeks ago, all of those risks are also risks for Alzheimer's disease. And we now know that there's a close interaction between vascular disease in the brain and Alzheimer's disease. So high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, diabetes, smoking, all of those vascular risk factors are also risks for Alzheimer's disease. So if you needed another reason to stop smoking, I'm sure no one in this room smokes anymore, but if you know anyone who smokes, that's another reason for them to try to stop. And I've listed hypertension and smoking under vascular risk factors. Um, there are some other questionable relations between risk factors and Alzheimer's disease. The, the, these are probably true that People who have developed depression in late life have a higher rate of Alzheimer's disease. People who have had a lot of head trauma, such as boxers, have a higher rate of developing Alzheimer's disease. That doesn't mean just, just one injury or one concussion, but recurrent concussions may be a, a risk. Uh, I've listed aluminum here, but I put it with a question mark. We don't really find that uh, in, uh, there's a large study in Canada, the Canadian Study of Health and Aging, and it was shown that using aluminum pots or aluminum containing antiperspirants did not increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So aluminum probably is not a, a risk for Alzheimer's disease. I know some people got rid of their aluminum pots a few years ago. Maybe you can go get them back. <laughs> there are also some, a few, a short list of protective uh, factors, things that seem to protect some members of the population from getting Alzheimer's disease. And one of those is arthritis. People who have arthritis have a lower rate of getting Alzheimer's disease, probably because they take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents such as Celebrex, Vioxx, Naproxen. These anti-inflammatories probably are protecting them against Alzheimer's disease. There has been good epidemiological evidence that people, women on estrogen, had a lower rate of developing Alzheimer's disease. But last year, they, they, there was a study, the Women's Health Initiative in the States, that tested this idea by randomly giving women estrogen or not, and they did not show a protective effect of estrogen. So this is why estrogen now has a question mark. It's not clear that going on estrogen really will protect you from Alzheimer's disease. If I was giving this lecture two years ago, I would have said estrogen is probably a good thing for the, the brain. Now I'm not sure. So I mentioned this Canadian study of health and aging, and I, I think this is one of the, the projects that we should really be proud of in Canada. This is the world's greatest study of the population to look at the elderly, to try to, trying to find how many people have dementia, have Alzheimer's disease, and what are the risks. And you'll see that they, they looked at many cases, and they felt that the increased risk was really related to the family history, low education, and they also found that people who were exposed to a lot of glues and pesticides had an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So you might not spray the bugs quite as much in the summertime. It might not be good for your brain. As I mentioned, arthritis and anti-inflammatories were protective, and they really didn't find a, a change with smoking, anesthesia, aluminum antacids or antiperspirants, and the other factors listed at the bottom. Now, I'm going to, to move from the area of Alzheimer's disease now to looking at people with mild memory loss and this mild cognitive impairment state. And this is a, a, a picture which is uh, a, a little concerning. This is a, a picture that shows PET scans. And what we see, these are the brains not of one person, but of about 15 people overlaid. And we're seeing changes in their blood flow, which are changes in the blood flow which we see in Alzheimer's disease. The only thing is, these people did not have Alzheimer's disease. They were perfectly normal but they are people who came from families with a lot of Alzheimer's disease. They were individuals who had this E4 gene that I mentioned, which is a risk factor. So this was a group of normal individuals at high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in the future. They did these PET scans, and lo and behold, changes can be seen already. So that means that 
when someone, what this implies or suggests is that when you get Alzheimer's disease, you're seeing the beginning of symptoms, memory loss, but the changes in the brain have been going on for years, maybe decades before you get the symptoms. So this, this is bad news in the sense that it's a long disease that only shows up at the end, but it's good news in the sense that maybe this gives us a long period of time when we can intervene. If we know someone's going to get Alzheimer's disease, and this is the way we're going for the future in therapy, if we, they're normal, we know they're at risk, we know they're going to get the disease, maybe in the future we'll be able to start medications and intervene to prevent the disease or to, to slow it down. Because if we can only slow it by 30 years, that's going to get rid of about 90% of the, the cases of Alzheimer's disease in the society. So that's really the goal of research right now. The earliest signs of Alzheimer's, I've mentioned a, a lot of this, but the presentation is variable. Memory loss is the most common thing, and people first complain of uh, they're repeating questions, they were told uh, uh, that someone's coming over to visit, and half an hour later they're saying, is someone coming over? Are we doing something? So repeating questions is a common first complaint. Misplacing items and not being able to find them. Forgetting errands, going out to Metro and not just forgetting one or two things on the list, but forgetting that you were going shopping altogether. These are the, the commonest early complaints. Language changes can also be an early complaint, such as finding words or finding names or um, remembering uh, names of animals that you haven't seen in a long time. Some people's first symptom is loss of judgment or a change in their judgment, sometimes related to driving. And there have been cases where, where people who eventually developed Alzheimer's disease started shoplifting or behaving abnormally in public. Personality changes, someone who is very uh, calm becomes very anxious. Someone who is very placid starts losing their temper more. These are, are sometimes that the, it doesn't mean that any time your spouse loses their temper, it's the beginning of a disease. But in retrospect, families often say that this was one of the earliest changes. Um, something as subtle as change, loss of sense of humor can be the, the first sign of Alzheimer's. So that's to encourage you to laugh at all of my jokes tonight just to, to make sure. New depression, someone who's never been depressed at 70 years old starts getting a depression, or someone who hasn't been anxious starts getting very anxious. These can be warning signs. Now, why is memory loss usually the earliest sign in Alzheimer's disease? Well, I'm gonna teach you a little bit about the brain in about 30 seconds. This is the brain. Deep in the, the brain, there are these structures which are called the limbic structures, and they're shown in blue here. And uh, these are, were described many years ago. There's sort of a circuit that's connected going from an area called the hippocampus here and the amygdala. These are in the temporal lobe and connecting to structures deep in the brain called the basal forebrain. And this loop is very involved in memory and it's very involved in smell and it's very involved in emotions. And the structures in this loop are where we start to see the changes of Alzheimer's disease. The amyloid plaques I showed you, the, the, the tangles, the neuronal degeneration often start most in the highest concentration in the hippocampus. So because the hippocampus is so important in memory, the earliest changes are usually memory. And this is why some people believe that changes in smell may herald the onset of changes in these limbic structures. So this is why we look for memory loss as the most common early change in Alzheimer's. So we're now defining a stage we're calling mild cognitive impairment. And that, that is to try and capture the, the time between the first symptoms and when we can reliably diagnose Alzheimer's disease in the clinic. So if we see the first symptoms are where the normal aging curve diverges from the, the curve that's going to become Alzheimer's disease. This here we're looking at performance of someone in terms of, of their memory and their thinking on, on tests such as tests that, that we gave you outside there. And this is over time. So the first symptoms are starting right here. But the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is only reliable when there's a, a big difference between the individual's performance and normal performance. So this area in between 
after the first symptoms before diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a stage we call mild cognitive impairment because many people with these mild memory changes are going to go on to Alzheimer's disease over time. Now, the, 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 the poster boy for mild cognitive impairment is really Ronald Reagan. And you, you may know that Ronald Reagan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1994. And now, unfortunately, he, he's quite severely affected. But if you go back and look at books written about his presidency, Remember, in the second year of his presidency, he had an assassination attempt, and he underwent surgery, a bullet was removed, and after that, his aides described him as being more apathetic, his personality changed, he started delegating more, he was less involved, and his memory was affected. And by the second term, he was having significant impairment in his memory. And the year after he left office, he went up in the Iran-Contra Commission, and they, he had to testify. He said, honestly, I can't remember that conversation. I, you're telling me I went to such and such a place. I can't remember it. So his, his memory was significantly affected even while he was president. So he probably went through about five or six years. In retrospect, it was mild cognitive impairment. And then he progressed to Alzheimer's disease later on. So this is what we're looking for, the people with mild memory loss. Now, as I outlined at the beginning, not everyone with mild cognitive impairment progresses to Alzheimer's disease. Um, mild cognitive impairment, the way we define it now, is someone who complains of memory loss, and we do testing in the clinic, and they have objective impairment. That means uh, we give them something to remember, such as our test outside. They don't remember the words. They forget. They can be shown to really forget what's going on day by day. However, outside of memory, their function is pretty much preserved. They're talking normally, they're, they're driving normally, they're, they're functioning in everything except for their memory. And we don't have a good cause for their memory loss. So this is important. It, there are other causes of memory loss. If someone has sleep apnea syndrome or is taking too many sleeping pills, these are, these are other causes for memory loss. And this is why anyone who has significant memory loss should be seen by their physician, their blood tests, could be thyroid problems or B12. These things have to be excluded before we can say it's mild cognitive impairment. And this is mild, so it's not severe enough for the person to be labeled as having a dementia. If we look in the, the brains of, of people, we can see clues that reflect what's going on with them clinically when we test their memory. And if we look at the, this is a, a, an MRI scan, such as you saw last week, this is a part of the brain which is the hippocampus that I showed you. And here is quite sort of it's a plump little lump there on the temporal lobe. Someone with Alzheimer's disease, you can see it's much darker. This area is shrunken. This shrinkage of the hippocampus is a sign that, of someone more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. And we can look in groups and see this is the same hippocampus here. Here it's seen on the side. In mild cognitive impairment, people start to get shrinkage, and in Alzheimer's disease, it's much more dramatic. So this is a way that we're going to hope to develop in the future to help us to diagnose mild cognitive impairment that is going to lead to Alzheimer's disease, because this is where we're at now. We're trying to find ways, and this is a major focus of our research here, is to find biomarkers, tests such as imaging tests or blood tests, that will tell us when someone has mild memory loss, is this the beginning of Alzheimer's disease? Or maybe they're just going to remain at the same level for the rest of their life and not get worse. So the search for biomarkers that will help us to predict the course in the future is a major area of emphasis right now. We know that 15% of people with mild cognitive impairment will progress to dementia every year. However, our, uh, our studies here at the Jewish General show that even if you follow people 10 years after their memory loss, about 25%, that's one in four, do not progress. So just because you have memory loss doesn't mean for sure it's the beginning of Alzheimer's disease. And this is another message I want to reinforce. Mild memory loss might be due to something else. It doesn't always progress to, to Alzheimer's disease. So while it's a concern and it's a risk, it is not definitely that you're going to get worse. So the focus now is to try to be much earlier in our diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. We're trying to get to the point where we can look at someone with very mild changes and say, 
Alzheimer's disease is going to be coming in five or ten years. And this will have a number of benefits. First of all, it allows us to be better in counseling, in talking to families, and telling them the prognosis, even though it, it's, uh, it, it's a bad prognosis. But at least we'll be able to be more accurate. We'll be able to allow people to, people to predict what their lives will be like in five or ten years. And this will help them in planning, planning where they're living and what they're doing with their families. And also, it gives us a very important wedge to allow us to start preventative therapies before the memory loss gets too significant. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute, talking about the therapies that are going to be available. So if you have mild cognitive impairment, what can you do to keep your memory as good as possible? <laughs> well, turns out it's the same thing that you would do if you were normal. And studies have shown that the, the list of things that we can suggest for people with mild memory loss is identical to the normal list. Intellectual stimulation, treatment of medical problems, preventing strokes, treating high blood pressure and cholesterol, keeping physically fit, avoiding sedatives, controlling your stress level. And the only thing I've added to the list is vitamins B6 and folate. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about different treatments and, and painting the future because I think we're at a real crossroads with respect to memory loss, with respect to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. 20 years ago, if I would have been giving this talk, there was really nothing to offer in terms of therapy. Now we have some significant medications. And coming down the pipe, there's a large group of medications which are, I think are really going to make the difference and perhaps even lead to a cure in the next 10 or 20 years. The way to look at the the, the treatment approach is to say there are different clinical states, as I've talked about. There's what we call normal, yeah, there we are. People who are normal, that 80% who have normal cognitive aging. And then we get a group where it's pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's. Remember that brain picture where the, the PET scans many years before they developed symptoms when they were behaviorally normal, those individuals were probably starting to have the early brain changes, plaques in the hippocampal area, which were the early brain changes of Alzheimer's disease without symptoms. Then, as you develop more changes of Alzheimer's disease, you f start to have memory loss and mild cognitive impairment. Finally, when the brain changes are much more widespread, you are diagnosed as having an Alzheimer's disease or a dementia state. So these are the, the stages of the disease. And we can intervene at, at the different stages. Right now, we have treatments for Alzheimer's disease, which I'll talk about in a moment. We have treatments we're trying to develop to give to people with mild cognitive impairment or to people who are, have no symptoms in whom we believe they're at high risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. This is what's being developed now. And the last area is primary prevention, what we can recommend in the future to people who are normal, who are the elderly, who are normal, who don't have any symptoms. Primary prevention is the way to go in the future. So the treatments, as I said, people with Alzheimer's disease, we can treat their cognition, we can treat their behavioral problems. People with mild cognitive impairment, we can try to devise treatments to stimulate their memory and slow progression to Alzheimer's disease. And in primary prevention, we can try to identify people who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease and in the future start preventative therapies. These are all at the level of research right now. First, let me talk about symptomatic treatment of Alzheimer's disease. What is available now? Well, if you know anyone who has Alzheimer's disease, almost certainly they're on one of the cholinesterase inhibitors. There are three of them, <coughs> Dinepazil, trade name Aricept, Rivastigmine, the trade name is Exelon, and Galantamine, the trade name is Reminil, which have been shown to be effective in improving the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. They produce a modest improvement, and they tend to stabilize individuals. Uh, we talk about rolling back the clock by 6 to 12 months. It's not going to allow someone to go back to work or, or resume activities they've given up, but a modest to moderate improvement is visible. There are about a quarter of the Alzheimer's disease patients who really don't seem to get much of a benefit, however. The most recent addition to this list is Memantine, a tree named Nemenda, which is now released in the United States. And we expect it will be sometime in the next 
a year to two released in Canada, we hope. This works through a different chemical mechanism. I'm not going to go into the details of the chemical mechanisms because of time, but these have been shown to improve the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Memantine has been shown to be effective in moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't really do much in the mild disease. And we're looking forward in the future to having people perhaps on a combination of therapy. And this is being researched right now. So these are medications that improve the symptoms. There's no evidence till now that they reverse the disease or stop the progression. So these are symptomatic therapies. There are a number of other therapies that have been tried and studied. One of them is vitamin E. Now, vitamin E is an antioxidant. It's a weak antioxidant. And there was one study that showed that Alzheimer's disease patients who take vitamin E have a delay in six to eight months in going into a nursing home. It wasn't shown that it improved their memory, but it seemed to do something. It's, it's unclear how good vitamin E is, and when we had a consensus conference in Canada, it was felt that the evidence was insufficient that we had to strongly recommend it to our patients. However, most patients with Alzheimer's disease are taking vitamin E. Uh, there's very little risk if you take one or two vitamin E capsules. So in the end, we tend to recommend it in the memory clinic. Ginkgo biloba is another medication that's been studied. Uh, it, the effect in Alzheimer's disease is probably about a quarter of the effect of the cholinesterase inhibitors. And again, it was felt that there was insufficient evidence to recommend it to our patients. As far as all the other medications out there for Alzheimer's disease, they're all at the stage of research and clinical trials. Nothing has been released yet. We're hopeful that more symptomatic drugs will be released in the future, but we really have to wait for the trials to be completed because some of these are potentially dangerous medications. Do the cholinesterase inhibitors slow the progression from MCI to dementia? In other words, when you have mild memory loss, if you take Aricept or Reminil or Exelon, will it slow, if you're going to go on to Alzheimer's disease, will these medications prevent that? We don't know. There are no results to date showing that these medications prevent Alzheimer's disease. There have been studies ongoing <coughs> in, in our memory clinic and other memory clinics around the world. Uh, the galantamine study in MCI was recently discontinued with a negative uh, result. There are studies with denepazil and rivastigmine and vitamin E which are ongoing. And some of these studies will be released this summer. So we may have the first evidence that, that MCI can be slowed in its progression, this is one of the areas we're very interested in. So as far as the question, do cholinesterase inhibitors slow progression, we don't have the answer yet. What about studies of medications to prevent Alzheimer's disease? This is really much more important area than treating the symptoms. And the fact is, and to this date, we don't have a good positive study. There was this big study I referred to in the United States looking at estrogen. The result was negative, much to the surprise of myself and many others who believe that, that there were population studies showing that estrogen w was a preventative factor and lowered the risk. The actual study when estrogen was given randomized to women was a failure. Uh, studies with anti-inflammatory medications, again, the population studies were very encouraging. People with arthritis who take anti-inflammatories seem to have a lower rate of getting Alzheimer's disease. But when a study was constructed and randomization occurred, we've been unable to show that giving anti-inflammatory pills or prednisone prevents Alzheimer's disease. And that's also a disappointment. There are a, a number of other negative studies with piracetam. Um, but many studies are ongoing. There are studies underway right now looking at statins which are anti-cholesterol drugs. There's a good reason to think that statins may prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease. These studies are ongoing right now around the world and in Canada. Uh, ampokines are chemicals that stimulate the memory mechanism. These are being tested around the world. Antioxidants are being tested. Anti-amyloid therapy, there was an initial attempt to use immunization. It appears to be effective, but a small group of individuals with Alzheimer's disease, receiving the immunizations develop inflammation in the brain and encephalitis, and some of them became very, very sick. 
and that initial study was discontinued. However, other forms of immunization are probably going to be restarted, and I think that this question of immunization to block amyloid to try to prevent Alzheimer's disease, we're going to hear more about this in the future. If you look in the, the, around the memory clinics around the world, there are about another dozen very serious candidate medications that are being studied to prevent Alzheimer's disease, to prevent its progression, to prevent MCI turning into Alzheimer's disease. We can do no more than encourage our patients to get involved in these studies because this is going to get us to the answer and hopefully within a, a matter of months or a few years. Let me finish with a couple of slides on other things that are important to consider in trying to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And one of them is reducing your vascular risk. I've already talked about this a bit, but we strongly recommend for people with mild memory loss, such as MCI, that even though we don't have good studies proving these are effective strategies, there's strong reason to think that it's worthwhile. Anything that prevents stroke helps prevent Alzheimer's disease. There are studies around the world showing that if you, you aim to prevent stroke, you aim to lower blood pressure, treat cholesterol, avoid smoking, treat diabetes, you end up with a lowering of the rate of Alzheimer's disease. And it, this is an important strategy. Homocysteine, this is currently being studied, but homocysteine levels seem to be related to strokes and heart disease. If you have, your homocysteine level is too high, it can be brought down by very simple mechanisms, eating a lot of spinach. Who here has eaten spinach in the past week? Put up your hand. Terrific. <laughs> Very smart thing to do. Uh, if you have B6, B12, and folate, which you get in green leafy vegetables or in multivitamins, this helps lower the homocysteine level and may be a very effective strategy to try to prevent the vascular effects, which may exacerbate or bring out Alzheimer's disease. So certainly green leafy vegetables are, if you need another reason to, to have green leafy vegetables, this is another reason to do so. There are non-drug therapies that may be effective in preventing MCI, mild cognitive impairment, progressing onto Alzheimer's disease. And we've already talked about them, but I'm just going to mention them again. One is exercise. Uh, again, it's been shown that, that people with mild memory loss who were active, were active in doing exercise, uh, and active in terms of using their brains, had a lower rate of progressing to Alzheimer's disease. So physical activity, social activity, leisure activity, these are all important things that, that you can do if you have memory loss. And if you know someone who has mild memory loss, these are things that there's no downside in exercise or playing bridge. And this is something we should encourage all of the, our older friends and relations to do. Uh, again, treating medical problems, avoiding sedatives, alcohol, fatigue, depression, and stress control. These are, are beneficial and they, they don't cost much and you don't need a prescription. In conclusion then, we're at the stage where symptomatic treatments for Alzheimer's disease are available. More symptomatic treatments are on the way, we believe. Treatments to stabilize or prevent the progression of MCI to Alzheimer's disease this is the goal. We want to get people, when they're starting to have the very first changes in their memory, choose and pick out the, those who are actually going to go on and get worse and stop the disease right then while they're still functional and active. This is our goal and this is the, the goal of our lab laboratory and many laboratories around the world. And really what's going to get us there is support for research. So I think that uh, as it comes up to voting time, one of the things that nobody thinks about when they look at the, the whole question of healthcare is, are we doing enough research to prevent the, the increase in Alzheimer's disease, which is going to come in the next 10 or 20 years? Only research is going to get us there. Current therapies, therefore, are the first step on a long road to a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Research is very important, and you may have seen the uh, list out there. We do a lot of research here at the Jewish General Hospital not only involving patients with Alzheimer's disease who, who very kindly volunteer in the memory clinic, but we need normal people, people who think their memory is pretty good or they may not be as good as when they were 20, but it's about as good as other people their own age. We need you to volunteer to give your time to help us in our research. So we encourage you, if you didn't sign up before, if you can give a few hours for memory testing and MRI scans, uh, 
give us your name and phone number and we'll phone and, and try and get you involved in some of this when it's convenient for you and uh, try and get you involved in our research efforts. On that note, I want to thank you for your presence tonight. It's been a delight to be here and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much.